Now that we've discussed some very basic polymer chemistry, we're going now going to move into the area of some more refined, or I should say, more specific viewpoint of materials management specific to our, to our uh, materials that we use in our lab, our sheet stock materials. So we're going to go through the orthotic and process, process definition. We'll use it, look at the extrusion process, how sheet materials are actually taken from that, a raw polymer state into a sheet stock or solid sheet form. We'll look a little bit at material specifications. We're looking at some of the incoming inspections that you can do in, for materials coming into your lab. We'll look at uh, determining and managing the machine direction of your sheet stock. And then we've already talked about brand names and versus generic names, and we might touch on that again. Again, we're still at the top of the triad looking at materials management in terms of putting that process discipline into your lab. Now, clinical thermoforming is uh, a specific definition of what we do for our orthotic and prosthetic application. And I came up with this definition primarily because as I talked to polymer engineers and I said I did thermoforming, they would say, what kind of thermoforming do you do? And specifically, we do heavy gauge, cut sheet, encapsulation, vacuum thermoforming. Really describes the full breadth of our process. Now, to break it down into those terms individually, heavy gauge means that we use sheets of plastic that are too thick to supply in a roll. So that refers to the differences within the plastic industry itself, or I should say industrial thermoforming. Thin gauge versus heavy gauge. Thin gauge would be making coffee cup caps or blister packaging for consumers like in pharmaceuticals. On the heavy gauge side, that means you're using material that has enough structural integrity to make a standalone product. Thin gauge, heavy gauge. Cut sheet. Our materials are too thick to put in a roll, that's thin gauge. We do cut a sheet specific to the size of our tooling to our positive model. Same as the industrial side. Drape forming is much like prosthetics, where you form in a frame, have a billow, flip it over a product. That's, refers, that's a little bit more mainline to industrial thermal forming. Encapsulation, where we take that heated piece of thermoplastic material and drape it over a model and draw out the air underneath and then suck it underneath, so to speak, in gross terms, onto the surface of that male tool, that's very indigenous to our field. I've never seen it done in a commercial thermal in a commercial setting, just because unless it was for a prototype, uh, not in mainstream high volume production. And of course, vacuum. Uh, you can have compression match tooling um, where you don't need uh, vacuum uh, for a thermal forming type of process. Uh, our resin from that refiner basically comes into a small bead, as you can see here. I'll take out a couple beads themselves and. It basically just comes out, almost looks like a popcorn kernel for the most part. Uh, that's the raw form of most poly polymer materials as it comes from the refiner or the polymerization plant. Um, from there, it is then transported in bulk form. Uh, that solid bead form comes out of the refinery. Uh, I say that this is not an OMP lab-based process, obviously because of the nature of the polymerization equipment that you were to use. You wouldn't go out and say, oh, I'll buy a tank of propylene and put it through my little chemical apparatus in your lab and end up with these beads and then put an extruder. That would be, eh, who'd want to do that? That's just too much capital equipment, too many processes to control. There's that part of that mass management of polymer materials is handled for us by somebody else. But, and, and that's, and I, and I say that in reference to what we do with thermosets. Thermosets, we do create a polymerization process. Take the resin, catalyst mix it together, put it within our vacuum elimination bags, and boom. We're controlling we're, and we're actually conducting our polymerization process. Because of thermoplastics many times being broken down from a gas, ethylene gas, into a polyethylene, we just don't have the lab-based apparatus that allows us to do that in a small-scale operation. It has to be done on a large-scale opera uh, uh, operation. So consequently, as those big refiners, we've seen one picture before, and I've thrown up a couple more, they do look like a big refinery. They come out with these little beads of material is the end product from that type of polymerization plant. Then it has to be, of course, bulk transported. Typically, here in the United States, you've got two forms of transport. One is a big 
rail car, tanker car, move cross country by freight train. Uh, once it gets into a specific area, some plants are big enough where they'll have their own, their own side track. The rail cars will pull in and they just load everything by big vacuum lines. The other methodology is tanker trucks. You think all the tanker trucks that you see on the road, semi-trailers, are all moving liquids? Many times they're not. Some are plastics. And ironically, as a, uh, uh, where I grew up, I had some connection to the thermoplastic industry. That truck you see there was one of my uncle's trucks. So as a kid through high school and through some of my college, I actually worked for him, operated that truck. It was a big tanker truck that actually would hook up. If so, it was the right pictures from the, his actual freight yard. We worked in the wintertime. I grew up with that snow uh, where we'd hook up big vacuum lines to the rail car, suck the beads into the tanker truck, and then we would make deliveries to the small injection molding plants that were in the northern Rhode Island and southern Massachusetts area. So I never knew that I would have a connection with the plastic industry from then to now, believe me. And uh, um, one of the, the um, you know, you, you always have those jobs when you're a kid that you remember back going, I don't want to do this as an adult. I can always remember going on the inside of that tanker truck and having to clean or purge the inside of that tanker truck as we picked up different types of resins because you didn't want to have any cross con contamination. So being on the inside of that tanker truck on a hot August day, you, you just knew that when your mom said you wanted to go to the college, that was one of the jobs that you had that just reinverse that concept. So, but nonetheless, in that area, we would come up, pull up to a big, what looked like a grain hopper, put those beads within that hopper, and then from there through pneumatic lines would be fed directly to the individual processing equipment, whether it was in mostly injection molding uh, companies in the area. Now, ironically, you've all probably heard of Tupperware. Uh, it was started by Earl Tupper, who was from uh, New England as well. Came up with the concept of using plastic in resealable containers for the storage of, of leftovers. Created a multinational company. Um, some of his plants were basically located in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island, and, and we always remembered uh, the Tupper plants near, near us. Uh, so the whole history of thermoplastics, you know, not only Tupperware, which is one of their old postcards for having one of those home parties, was located in New England. Uh, primarily, the plastic industry in the United States, going back industrial history, was started in a town called Lemonster, Massachusetts, right outside of Worcester. The reason Lemonster became the Silicon Valley of plastics was back in the era of the clipper ships that, and of course New Bedford with whale oil, which was the first type of oil that was used as a fuel, uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, that they used to take organic types of polymers, tortoise shells, and Lemonster was the largest producer of combs, uh, either cosmetic combs for grooming your hair or decorative combs in the world. And based out of the, the you know, obviously the animals that they used to capture around the world, bring them back to New England, process into these decorative combs. So when the first thermo, the synthetic polymers came along, because they were already producing combs, decorative combs from uh, animal materials, they started using synthetic materials. So Lemonster started as the site of the plastic industry in the United States. Uh, still to this day, within New England, there is a very high level of uh, density of industries that are still involved with thermal with injection molding. Now, a good part of it is all medical injection molding because as the simple injection molding has moved offshore the very refined type of high-level thermal forming uh, in terms of economic survivability is still located in that area and that's what they've gravitated to. I went to a mass plastics conference here about two years ago and they had 300 companies that are all involved mostly with uh, medical injection molding in New England states. So it was fascinating to see it from that standpoint. And, and um, uh, for myself growing up in northern Rhode Island in a town called Woonsocket, Rhode Island, we had uh, Tupperware plants all around us. Now they're all gone. They've all been either burnt down, torn down, or turned into condominiums. So uh, that industry has moved offshore because it's a very simple type of consumer product. So that's where the industry comes from. Um, the river I grew up on, the Blackstone River, was where Sl Samuel Slater had the first textile mill back in the late 1700s. So the Blackstone River really was the site of our start of our industrial revolution here in the United States. And that's where my ancestors going back nine and 14 generations of French Canadians came down to work in the textile mills. 
The uh, National Plastic Center is located in Lemonster, Massachusetts. They have a good website. They do educational programs. If you're ever in Massachusetts in that Worcester area uh, between uh, Springfield and Worcester, nice place to go visit to see their, their museum there. I've been there a couple times and know the director and the director of education there that I've communicated with. Um, in terms of, pocket, of uh, market utilization for polypropylene, ironically at this point in time, only about 2% of all polypropylene that's produced actually ends up in sheet form, 2%. And most of it ends up in injection molding or fibers, you know, the two largest type of applications of polypropylene material. And as you know, as you go into any consumer store, that fibers, you know, being a synthetic fiber, it ends up in clothing, it ends up in lines. Uh, Spectra is a stretched version of polypropylene, very high strength line used for water skiing and lines on sailboats. Uh, bulletproof vests and that kind of thing. So the fibers are basically 29% of that market. Uh, in terms of polypropylene, in terms of its physical qualities, it's got good optical properties, uh, excellent uh, chemical resistance. If we put UV additives into it, it has good weathering resistance, good UV type of resistance, excellent fatigue resident, um, uh, resistance, and that's probably one of the two reasons that we use it uh, the other one being excellent for impact and stiffness balance, as they call it in this breakdown of polypropylene quality. So those two four kind of areas of this quality uh, sphere is why we use polypropylene. It's also inexpensive. Uh, and also, it's one of the highest strength or highest stiffness types of sheet plastics that we have. That's why we've never really found a good alternative to polypropylene at this point in time. Drawbacks, like everything else, there's pro and con. It is semi-crystalline. That means when you heat it, it has very poor sag strength. Sag strength is, is when you heat a material to its temp melt temperature, you know, how, how viscous is it? Does it droop quickly? And with polypropylene, being semi-crystalline, you heat it, you heat it, you heat it. It gets to the point where those crystallites want to, the van der Waal forces want to release the attraction between the polymer chains and all of a sudden, boom, it, it can just droop. Very, very quick drop off. Not like an amorphous material that just kind of gets softer off or over a broad range of temperature. Semi-crystallines have a very sharp type of change, makes it very difficult from an automated processing standpoint. Um, so that's why they call it a quick viscosity transition at melt, right? to be specific in the language. High orientation. Orientation is another one of those industry terms that can be used in different ways or can be referred to by different names. Uh, orientation is what's used in the plastic industry to describe what we call shrinkage. Right? In other words, orientation, it's the reorientation of those polymer chains into a crystalline structure. Reorientation means how much is going to shrink. So you'll hear that term orientation used in, uh, constantly within the written literature and of course orally within the plastic industry. And then polypropylene also has a cold sensitivity. It has a very high glass transition temperature. Now glass transition temperature means when a material acts glass-like, right? Just like a regular window glass, window pane. With, poly, with um, polypropylene, I, it, it's, temp, it's high glass transition temperature means that as the material gets cold, it becomes really stiff and at that point becomes very susceptible to catastrophic, to catastrophic failure. It's so high that from an empirical standpoint, many practitioners in the northern states, Bangor, Maine, to um, basically Portland, Maine, or you know, Boise, Idaho, because it's a little bit further north, the B2B line, if you draw kind of a great circle type, a compass path across the map of the United States, you find practitioners up in those northern climates sometimes will use a coal polymer instead of homopolymer polypropylene. And that's because by putting a little bit of polyethylene into the polypropylene, it lowers the glass transition temperature so the, the orthosis is not as susceptible to cold fracturing in those cold climates. So, so we've kind of empirically shifted the choice of materials in the northern states just on the basis of that cold breakage. Um, if we were very sophisticated, we would probably have developed a cold temperature use polypropylene that has a lower glass transition temperature. But because we're such a small field and our volumes of usage of material isn't that high, and it's dispersed through many different distributors, that one distributor basically won't take on the economic challenge of developing that
that low temperature use polypropylene. Does, it just doesn't have enough economic viability in order to accomplish that. Uh, so as I said earlier, uh, sheet stock, in terms of the overall use of polypropylene, only results in about 2% of the material. And within the thermoforming industry, uh, homopolar polypropylene is not the material of choice. It's used very little in mainstream industrial thermoforming because of the processing difficulty of that quick transition from, from solid to melt state and the lack of good sag strength. They've tried to manipulate it as much as possible. There are ways to manipulate it, but it still becomes a very difficult physical aspect of polypropylene to manage in large-scale industrial production. In terms of the sheet stock itself, when they're manufacturing, uh, taking that raw beads and then saying we want to put it into sheet form, that extruder is going to take that raw material. He has to have certain physical characteristics of that resin blend to match his process of heating these beads, forcing it through a machine, and turn it into a sheet stock material. And then, of course, us as a thermoformer have our own needs of the material. So whoever develops the basic formula of polypropylene, they have to serve two masters. They have to serve the needs of the extruder so they can turn out a good final product, and then they have to serve the needs of the thermoformer who is also then turning out a final product. So they have to serve two masters. Anytime you have to serve two masters, it becomes a difficult because it's always a type of compromise. Now, in our field, one of the basic questions I hear all, all the time, are there set specifications for orthopedic grade materials? And that's a very simple answer, no. There is no authorizing or oversight body. In other words, our academy or AOPA uh, or NCOPE or ISPO or any of the large organizations in our field, none of them have ever set a standard for orthopedic materials. Now, because we don't fall under some of the FDA guidelines, the FDA does not have specifications for orthopedic fields, for materials, specifically for our field. Now, there are orthopedic grades of ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene, and typically they're used as bearing surfaces within an implantable prosthesis specifically for uh, doing a total knee arthrodesis or a total hip arthrodesis. Right? They use it as bearing surfaces. That is a very specific type of plastic that's made to FDA guidelines. But FDA guidelines for us, there's none. From any of our oversight associations, there's not either. So it's a very open market at this point in time. The generic understanding is that orthopedic grade materials are virgin materials. In other words, these beads are purchased from the resin manufacturer. They're put into an extrusion machine to make the sheet and there's no, no recycling that occurs, no regrind as they call it. It's all made from virgin beads of material. And as we go into an overview in the next couple slides of the extrusion process, that might become a little bit clearer to you at that point in time. So as I said, no regulatory oversight at this point in time. ASTM, ISO, AOPA, Academy, ISPO, none of them basically produce any standards for oversight for the production of an orthopedic grade material that's not FDA, specific to OMP. Extrusion process itself, this is a schematic what it would look like. This is a big hopper, uh, what this is kind of like this funnel looking thing is called. That big hopper receives the beads. The beads are then fed into a big screw apparatus um, that under pressure and external heating of that barrel will melt the thermoplastic beads into a, um, of course, melt temperature plastic at that point in time. It'll, it'll come out an adjustable set of dies into a gauge that's the thickness what we want for our sheet material. From there it'll go into final sizing rolls to, for the gauge or thickness of the material, finishing rolls, and then at that point in time of course going into a cooling area. Um, the pitch or the design of the screws that fit within the barrel of that extruder can be designed specifically to the resin. So there's, a, there's an incredible amount of engineering that just goes into how those screws are designed and can be designed, as I said, specifically to the resin, how it manipulates the resin as it heats it within the barrel. And of course, they produce from the extrusion process, depending on the die that you have at the end of your machine, you can make it into all kinds of profiles. Here you can see in that left-hand side is channels 
There's L channels, there's T channels. Uh, you can make solid rod, and of course, you can also make sheet material. So anything that's a continuous process, anything that can be squeezed out of a die or shape that can be squeezed out of a die uh, can be made from these thermoplastic materials in a continuous extrusion process. Um, additives and compounds, something we haven't talked about yet when we were talking about chemistry, but it is certainly something that is within the realm of coming up with a resin that's specific to an endpoint application. Um, compounding, additives are what you put in to change the material. Compounding is what they, is more or less how they mix it all up together. So as if I was making a copolymer where I'd be taking a little bit of polyethylene and a majority of polypropylene and mixing it together. There's a do ways you can do that. You can do that in the refinery process where they are mixing the gases together and making a copolymer. Or you can do it in, by compounding, where I would take pre-made beads, mix them together, and then at that point, as I mix them and put them through my extruder, then I would come up with that optimal mix of polyethylene and polypropylene. So there's a different ways to make the alloys, right? Copolymer is an alloy, making it from different materials. The materials are polypropylene, polyethylene, making that alloy. So that's compounding. So both sides, additives and compounding, are, are very two integral parts of polymer chemistry. And, and then, of course, managing the production of these plastics downstream. Additives can be anti-static additives, anti-blocking agents, meaning they increase the flow of the material through the instruction through the extruder. UV agents, obviously, for sunlight exposure, and then pigments for colorization, as we see sometimes for cosmetic needs. Um, you've probably seen the result of additives in a plastic in your own automobile. If you've parked your car outside in the sun for a few days, uh, you'll notice that sometimes there's a film that more or less forms on the inner surface of your windshield. What that is, is the outgassing of some of the additives that they put into the plastics that are on your automotive interior. And as you know, most of the automotive interiors are almost all plastic, or a high percentage are covered with pla uh, plastics. Um, in the cushioned areas of your dashboard for protection, for impact protection, for passenger safety, as you know, they typically have foam underlies and then a, a skim or a skin of plastic on top. That skin is, is kept flexible by a plasticizer. Well, as the cars age, exposed to UV light and heat, those plasticizers or those softening agents, basically what they call bloom out. They just basically outgas, and of course, then because it's a gas, will deposit themselves all over the interior of your, of your automobile, but because you can see through your windshield, you can see how basically it's deposited itself, and then of course you have to go in and, wet and wax it. After a long period of time, with the, with the plasticizer coming out of that plaster, it gets brittle, and as you know, older cars sometimes basically will have a cracked dashboard. That's the degradation cycle that occurs with the plastic that's covering the soft cushioned part of your interior plastic pieces, okay? Natural degradation process. For us, what it means for us is if sometimes you pick up that plastic sheet, uh, the raw sheet before it's formed into an orthosis, and you'll, if you reflect it in ambient light, there'll be a haze, kind of a film on it. That's basically some of the plastic additives that are blooming out of the plastic. And now I've been told with polypropylene, you really shouldn't keep your polypropylene over six months on your lab shelf. Right? It gets into materials management here. So here's a, a good hint. You don't want old plastic because if you've got old plastic, the physical characteristics change because some of those additives have bloomed out of the plastic. So it's kind of like having a born on date. You know? How old is that plastic? Well, it should only be so many years old. I should say so many months old because otherwise it'll age and it'll change some of its physical characteristics. You might end up with a product that once you form it for a patient, it might not have the life cycle that you expect because it's aged polypropylene. It's just old polypropylene. So be aware of that in terms of, of, of making sure that you're buying your plastic from a distributor that has a pretty high turnover rate. In other words, they're bringing in new material every single month, primarily because they always have fresh materials on hand. Here's an example of an extrusion line. The die, the coat hanger die, is right here. The barrel with the screw is basically this slanted apparatus at the top. So the plastic beads coming in through the top of this, being fed into the die, basically through the screw under heat and pressure. It's coming out into a coat hanger die because it comes into a very wide outlet. 
being deposited on very highly polished stainless steel rolls for that gauging and of course it's that surface finishing. It can either be a gloss finish, could be a matte surface, um, depending if it's a very sophisticated line. You've all seen the synthetic woods that are out there. They can basically imprint that with wood graining. So depending on what the end product is, those rolls will change. A coat hanger die is used for flat sheet production. That means from the outlet from the barrel as it comes out of the tube, so to speak, the plastic is then squeezed out through a very narrow opening so it comes into a very wide type of die, typically in the width or the final width of the sheet, which is just over 48 inches in the United States. That's the typical large gauge machine will make a sheet that's finished to about 48 inches wide. From there, it goes into a cooling room. In this room, you can see it's coming in from the extrusion apparatus itself. This is an ear knife, electrostatic ear knife. That will keep the dust from coming into the room because obviously if you have hot plastic that's being cooled on top of these rollers, you don't want any debris landing on those rollers so that you can maintain its good optical clarity. This is a polycarbonate line. So as it moves down the line, uh, it basically is being hopefully cooled at the same rate on top and the bottom. This is where also you would have some stress relieving occurring. Stress relieving meaning that you maintain and cool it at the same rate at the top and the bottom. Stress relieving really isn't a factor in our field. Uh, you can buy stress release material. It doesn't mean any, it doesn't have any uh, impact for our field because we are using melt temperature forming. Stress relieved materials are typically used for non-melt forming into consumer products or some endpoint product. We basically go beyond that. We stress relieve when we bring it to melt temperature. So. Uh, buying stress relief material has no impact on an OMP lab process, but this is where it would be done in the continuous extrusion manufacture of sheet materials. As it gets to the end of the line, here as you know many of our clear materials, in order to maintain a good surface clarity or keep the surface from scratching, they'll put a barrier film on it, a protective film, and you can see that blue film is being fed on to both sides of that sheet as it's cooling so that way there when it comes out of the line into the cu cutting facility you maintain that clarity keep it from getting scratched you can get it keep it from collecting dust now that it's passed out of the cooling segment of the line passes into a cutting facility this is almost like a dirty room in our OMP lab they want to contain it because there are power saws there are abrasive saws that are cutting the material creating dust and uh, atmospheric debris that they want to keep off the material so it's segmented from the cooling facility. Here you can see the two circular saws. While it's being cut, these circular saws are completely contained within a housing so that any debris can be vacuumed off and they can have some dust control. Uh, the material that's cut off here at the side to make it into a finished product of 48 inches, the cutoff or the edge trim is regranulated and recycled and this is what they call regrind okay so this comes in to the difference between virgin material and regrind material now in some production regrind is okay as long as you know how much it is and you know the physical characteristics of that sheet with having a certain percentage of regrind material but within orthotics and prosthetics our understanding of a generic definition of OMP materials is that it's made from virgin materials. It's only made from those beads that are coming straight from the refinery, straight from the company that's polymerizing, whew, long day here, um, this material so that it's coming fresh to you, so to speak, like your local baker. Regrind material versus not having regrind and virgin material. Any of that scrap material that typically comes off trim out from making a sheet or after you vacuum form the sheet, the trim out that's taken off the product, that in large operations is recycled. It can go through a regranulator, big machine that just basically chops that plastic up. As you can see here, the multicolored type of plastics that's, uh, that's been recaptured, it can be recycled, made into basically products that maybe do not need the full characteristics of a virgin material. So that goes on constantly in large operations. In our field, very, very um, sparsely used. The only people that use it are making off-the-shelf type products because they have definitive tooling, they're making the same product all the time. And it's not so much that they're making off-the-shelf products, is that they can capture 
that trim out material in a clean state so there's no contaminants. As you know, when we trim off our material from a plaster model, sometimes it has our nylons that we use as a bleeder layer or evacuation layer, has pieces of plaster in it. So we can't keep the cleanliness of a material at the standard that they would need for recycling. And also our volumes just aren't there. We're not producing thousands of pounds a month of regrind or material that can be recycled. So typically it's sometimes it just comes down to a volume nature. So even though when we cut our plastic off, we have a, you know, basically about a third goes to waste. Unfortunately, there's just no practical way for us to recycle that material at this point in time from a volume standpoint, from a contamination standpoint. But in the plastic industry, that is used constantly. And as, as you know, um, the um, recycling from your own, your own uh, home scrap materials is, is being pushed more and more all the time. And that's why at this point most consumer products do have a classification specification symbol for the type of material it is. And here you can see low density polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, high density polyethylene, and, and uh, PET material, PET G basically. So all those materials are very standard for packaging. Consumer products can be recycled. Um, here now we'll go back to the, looking at the same, the end of the, of the extruding process. Here's the circular saws that we just had a close-up view of. Just downstream from the circular saw, which are cutting it to a finished width, now we want to cut it into a segment. Cutting it into a segment means they need a gantry saw. A gantry saw moves at the same speed as the material of the, of the sheet material that's now solidified, coming out of the machine, cuts it into a segment. So as, as, as the line is moving, the saw moves, cut across, cut it into a segment, comes back, gantry comes back in, comes again, and we'll cut that into a segment so that we there, then it can be picked up. Now that we have a segment that's been cut from that continuous flow of sheet coming out of the extruder, then we have a sheet stacker. This overhead apparatus with a gantry and a robotic type of assembly that comes down with little vacuum cups, comes to the top of the plastic, adheres to the sheet, picks it up, transfers it over, and you can see basically puts it here on top of a pallet so it can be stacked and then basically warehouse through the use of a forklift at that point in time. So that's the basic extrusion line. Uh, they run continuously, they run 24-7, they run huge amounts of volume. Typically to order plastic from a large extruder, you have to order 50 to 100,000 pounds of material because they have to purge or clean the machine every time they run a different type of resin through the machine. It can use multiple resins, but you don't want cross-contamination. So that's a certain amount of downtime, and they have a certain material that goes through the machine that they purge it, so that way there it's clean for the type of resin that you want to use. So they have to run large production here, keep that machine moving for it to be um, a uh, cost effective to run those machines 24-7. So usually 50,000, 100,000 pounds, are not uh, a small order for those type of machines. If you compare it to our field, it takes about three and a half pounds. If you think of the plastic that we use in order to vacuum form an AFO, basically takes about three and a half pounds of polypropylene uh, in order to make a solid ankle or an articulated uh, ankle, uh, ankle foot orthosis. So if you think of that three and a half pounds, just think how many pounds you'd go through in 100,000 pounds or how many AFOs you'd have to fabricate. So again, that's why our plastic is basically sold on a generic basis through many different distributors all around the United States because it is very generic in nature. In terms of orientation variables, the way that an extrusion machine is operated can impact physical characteristics into the sheet material. Speed of the extrusion line, how fast they're moving material through the machine can change the molecular chain structure of that polymer. Um, basically how quickly it's not only being pushed through the machine, but how it's being pulled out of the machine, and also basically the cooling. We talked about stress relieving. And, you know, basically how good they are making sure that that sheet as it moves through is cooled at the same rate both on the top and the bottom of the sheet as it becomes a solid sheet at that point in time. Those are all variables that can be impacted by the extrusion process itself. Right? Now we talked about that orientation, how much sh sh shrinkage occurs in the sheet. There is a natural amount of shrinkage that occurs, and I'll have some figures that will come up in a couple slides, that occur with semi-crystalline materials. There are also orientation factors just from 
how quickly you push the, the plastic through the machine. If you push it through too fast and cool it too quickly, it will not have enough time to reorient itself into that semi-crystalline structure and increases the orientation or increases the shrinkage. Um, so knowing your machine direction of your sheet is a very important part of the process. Um, I think it's critical to your materials management of your raw sheet materials coming into your lab. Now machine direction is defined from Rosato's dictionary as the flow of the extradate in an endless semi-finished product from a primary extrusion process. Okay? That's the official definition. In other words, it's the way this stuff is being squeezed out of the machine, that's the machine direction. Now, the influence on that structure is if they pull it too hard or push it too hard, then it stretches out that semi-crystalline structure. And if they cool it in that stretch position, it's almost if you took a rubber band, stretched it, froze it, sold it, put it in your oven, and then it wants to basically reorient. It wants to go back to what the polymer engineers call the lowest energy state. Right? In other words, we don't have any stresses in the material. It's in its natural affinity of a certain percentage of amorphous structure to a certain percentage of semi-crystalline structure, right? Lowest energy state. The intrusion process can impact that depending on how quickly or what their controls are for that extrusion process. Here's two different um, orientations, unoriented and oriented. And you can see basically how the polymer chains are all into, uh, uh, tangled with each other. Well, if you stretch it a little bit, you've put some orientation in it. It's not in its lowest energy state. When you're making an orthosis where you want this to basically be the same shape as your positive model, you want to have that polymer structure in its lowest energy state. It also be tied into an annealing process, which we'll come to later on. Here's what it would look like under that microscope. It'd almost be like graining in wood. You've had this stretch to it. You've had these long polymer chains that take an orientation to it. So that can be something, that's something that we do not want to see in the sheets that we're buying because then we don't, it increases the normal amount of shrinkage that we have in our sheets. And that piece of plastic that you pick up on your lab looks rather benign as a piece of polypropylene. You know, it's just basically opaque in nature. Um, there is a bias to the amount of orientation or the amount of shrinkage that's in that sheet. In the transverse direction, it can be anywhere from 1 to 3%. In the machine direction, it can be anywhere from 6 to 12%. So even though that sheet looks rather benign as we buy it in a rectangle or a square, there is a bias on the molecular level that we can't see with the naked eye. Now that intrusion induced plastic shrinkage does require us to have some materials management and some process management that you have probably never, haven't used in your lab before. Because if we look, this comes out of uh, Bill McConnell's book uh, where he had this chart and I, and I uh, scanned it just to show you what he's got in his textbook. But he published this book as part of his DVD program, shows different materials, shows their normal shrinkage rate and their most often. And here with polypropylene, 1.2 to 12.2 percent shrinkage. So if you have anybody ever tell you that they have polypropylene, it doesn't shrink, uh, they don't understand the method or they're just trying to tell you what you want to hear. In the real world, polypropylene, it doesn't shrink, doesn't exist because if we put it through our normal process of vacuum forming in our lab, it has to expand and shrink because that's the normal process of decrystallization from releasing the Van der Waals forces and then recooling into that, into that uh, solid room temperature uh, fa uh, phase of the plastic or form of the plastic. You always have shrinkage that occurs in our materials. Uh, the final part shrinkage can also vary with, again this is from Bill's book, mold temperature, the hotter the mold the more shrinkage, how quickly the part was formed, how long it remains on the mold, and that's basically uh, uh, has room for discussion as well. Uh, whether formed on a male or female mold and variations in the melt index of the sheet material. Melt index is sometimes tied to molecular weight and how much it flows at a certain temperature. For our purposes, the danger is taking that sheet of material and then aligning the machine direction so that it is in the transverse plane of an orthosis especially lower extremity. Because if we put it in a transverse plane, that means the orientation of the material is going to create the most shrinkage in that plane 
and increase the propensity for the CFO to spread open from the dimensions of our positive model. So we do not want to put the machine direction of our sheet in the transverse plane. We want it in the linear plane of our ankle foot orthosis. So we ran this exercise in our own lab. As I said, we, we did this exercise through a course of many years of changing our thermoforming process at Becker Orthopedic to improve our own central fab. And we use the same processes that everybody else and so that way that we've made this material available to everybody. So in terms of materials management, you can minimize that extrusion shrinkage in your lab by following a couple simple things. The machine direction with the linear axis of your positive model. Uh, remember that differential, that different bias of shrinkage orientation occurs in any sheet that you buy of polyethylene or polypropylene. When you cut off your coupon, sometimes we buy bulk sheets, cut off a manufacturing coupon, smaller size to fit the shape of our positive model. Make sure you cut that coupon so that you know the machine direction. This just shows how you use harvest different segments from a whole sheet. Always match the machine direction with that linear axis. And we went through our test. We did basically seven, had seven test coupons. We bought plastic from seven different distributors, some in the field, some outside the field. Divide out up the sheets into our test coupons, some with the transverse plane, some with the machine direction oriented to our positive model, and then we vacuum form these test cylinders. And as you can see, just with these here, I won't go through all the tests we did, but as you can see in these two test cylinders, the left side, the machine direction was in the transverse plane creating that spread. On the right side, the machine direction was with the long axis of the cylinder so that we ended up with a perfect match here. And that was the grossest examples that we, that we saw. So if you ever find yourself someday standing in your lab, you've cut out a plastic model, it's spread open on you even on a positive model, even place it on your patient and you're standing there with a heat gun trying to shrink this back down, that's the reason why. So if you think that's a waste of time, which it is, because it, you're not, if you have spread, you can minimize it by the control of your thermoforming process by having that process discipline. Right? Process discipline, as I said at the beginning, one of the primary goals of this program on clinical thermoforming. Manage your machine direction. And then here's some other examples. Some were better than others, depending on where we were buying our plastic, what kind of uh, uh, polypropylene it was. And you'll get this, you'll get this variant wherever you are in the country because you buy your materials typically from different uh, distributors. Sometimes those distributors buy their plastic on the open market and they're buying it from different extruders who then use different resin. We very rarely find out the exact resin that's being used in the thermoforming gray material that we purchase because it's commodity type of materials. When you go and buy a sack of flour at the store to bake a cake, typically you don't know where that wheat came from, what farmer was growing it, unfortunately, because it's a commodity type of material, unless, you, of course, you're buying boutique stuff that's created on that slow food type of mentality where it's, uh, it's accessed locally. We don't know who the farmer was. We don't know how he grew the, that grain because it's a commodity type of material. Many times polypropylene is the same way. It can be very, very generic in nature. And even if you did a custom type of polypropylene, I can you know, make good formulations, I understand it. If I had Gary's poly, you know, orthopedic grade polypropylene, would, you, would it make a difference? It would make some difference. We'd probably have some consistency, but because of the point that you would have to pay in order to have that custom extruded, custom resin for our field, you probably wouldn't want to pay the differential for what you would see in just buying commodity grade locally and having that, that, that variable that you have to deal with. So, uh, so we just haven't seen the cost economics of being able to do that at this point in time. In prosthetics, that machine direction doesn't have as much an effect, primarily because you're making a truncated cone. You're not making a slit cylinder. That cone basically can hide a lot of faults in your process because the stresses that you might impart on that thermoforming process do not have an outlet. As soon as you make a cut, boom, it can spring open. If you don't make a cut, it's not going to spring open. Those internal stresses will be captured within the product. It might decrease the 
longevity of the product, but not initially. It would come out over time, and that would be hard to monitor because it would be very difficult to set up a control and then, of course, a test procedure to, to demonstrate that, but you could. Um, I have heard of an interesting technique uh, used in prosthetics. Uh, where as you're forming the frame, you spiral the frame around your positive model. Now the empirical explanation I've heard from several prosthetists is they feel that their socket, if it's made from polypropylene, will end up being stronger. And ironically, it's not all empirical in nature. It's not an old wives' tale or an old husband's tale, uh, uh, to be politically correct about it. Um, that if you look in the literature, they call it shish kebabbing your polymer chains. So by when it's at melt temperature and you're putting that linear force on it, it has an orienting effect to the polymer chains. And since you're orienting the polymer chains, it's almost like making a linear polypropylene like you have a linear polyethylene. Sometimes it brings the chains a little bit closer together and it, and it probably could make it a little bit stronger. Now you'd have to go through, a, again, uh, a pretty rigorous academic study to prove that or not. But the tools do exist that if we wanted to make that differential and a, more or less approve or quantify that empirical technique that I've heard used out in the field, we could. We just never have. But it, it does have some scientific basis or some, some chemical basis. It's not all just uh, empirical in nature. Now, can you see the machine direction in a plastic sheet? No, can't. Unfortunately, can't. It'd be nice if we could. It'd be nice if we could hold up a piece of plastic and go, oh, yeah, machine direction is correct on this. Can't see it, unfortunately. Um, are there ways to determine it? Yes, there are. Melt gauge tests, polarizing light filters, sometimes surface landmarks, which you shouldn't see on it, but can be used on it. Cut sheet dimensioning and supplier ID are probably the most positive things. Now, I didn't bring my polarizing light filters, but that's, like use, that's basically using a polarizing filters where you can rotate them, change, polarize the light, and then you can see some refractive angles um, through the plastic. And in thin gauge materials like a salad, disposable sandwich or salad kind of container, you can see that with polarizing light filters. You can't see it with our uh, thick gauge polypropylene. Now, melt gauges are something that can be used, but not practical to us. It means you have a gauge, you cut a piece of plastic to the size of that gauge, you powder to the surface of the plastic, stack this in the oven, heat it, bringing the plastic to its melt temperature, cool it back down, and then since you've measured the sheet before and after the cooling, you would measure those, those shapes again, put it into a mathematical formula, it'll give you the amount of shrinkage and your orientation of the sheet. Now, that's widely used in the plastic industry. It's okay if you're buying a semi-trailer worth of plastic at a time to understand it. From our practical lab process, it's not really uh, from a practical lab aspect, it's, it's not practical to us, to be honest with you. Cut sheet dimension. As I said, in the United States, most of your sheet size is finished 48 inches wide, and then, it, of course, it's cut in a certain length. If you buy your sheet in a 4x8 sheet, then the 8-foot length is your machine direction. Sometimes I say only your distributor knows your machine direction because they're buying the bulk sheet. And if you buy less than a 4x8 sheet, then you're somewhat at the mercy of your distributor to orient their cutting of their coupons for shipment in a convenient fashion through FedEx or UPS because they will only handle a certain size material. So we all like to handle that or order a 24 by 48 inch sheet. Unfortunately, that 48 inches is not always in the machine direction, primarily because they'll put that 4 by 8 sheet and cut it with a panel saw, which I'm sure some of you have seen in a, in a lumber yard, in which I have here in, in a uh, smaller picture as a sidebar. That's just a circular hand saw mounted to a frame, so when you lay that 4 by 8 sheet on its side, you can cross cut it and come up with your 24 by 48 inches. Unfortunately, the 48 inches is not in the machine direction. So if you've pulled a K4 and AF4 out of that sheet, the machine direction would be in the transverse plane, meaning that it's more susceptible to spreading on you. So the only way you can know is by ordering a 4 by 8 sheet or working very specifically with your distributor. Sometimes I'll buy a sheet that's 24 by 96. That way there I know the 96 inches is all the way across. Or the other way is to buy 33, um, basically about 33, 33, 33. 
So that way there, I know the 33 is in the machine direction because they're not going to make any scrap. I have worked with some distributors in the past where they've put on a sticker onto my material. Um, that sticker just basically says direction of, of the extrusion. Unfortunately, a lot of distributors will not do this process for you, and they do have to train their warehouse people to basically know at the machine direction and then be accurate in the placement of these arrows so you know the machine direction. So, um, so it is, takes a little bit of discipline to train your distributors. The easiest thing I find, order a 4x8 sheet. Uh, I know all labs, because of a space requirement, can't do that, but probably that's the most definitive way that you can assure that you can manage your machine direction in your lab so you can reduce the orientation effect of placing your material in the transverse direction. Don't want to do that. Linear direction, right? Important factor in materials management. In terms of incoming visual quality checks, a couple simple things. Herringbone lines and chicken tracks. These are surface defects in the sheet of material should not see either one. The herringbone lines are these lines that will go all the way across a sheet. That typically in indicates a chain, a surge, a change in the smoothness of the line as it's producing a sheet. The chicken tracks typically are linear and they will come in a single line. Usually they indicate that there might have been a defect on the finishing rolls of that extruder. So it always comes around, clicks in the same spot, it's repetitive and it ends up with basically what they call chicken tracks. So if you get your sheet of material in your lab, shouldn't be any ripples, shouldn't be any chicken tracks. If there are, send that sheet back. Send that sheet back because that's an indicative that during the extrusion process there was a problem with producing that sheet. There might be an imbalance within the molecular chain structure of that sheet and you will not know what it is and that variable could affect your product. So I would send it back. You have to train your distributors to be good salespeople providing you the material that you're paying for. In terms of specification classifications, uh, there's general, mechanical, color, flammability, packaging, electrical, thermal, and optical. We typically don't see those. We get a little sticker that says polypropylene. Uh, plastics testing is obviously a big component within the engineering factors of the plastic industry. You can receive specifications on the amount of orientation, the density, dimensional tolerances, melt index, molecular weight, regrind, and sheet sag. When that polymer material is made by one of the big producers, all the product they sell come with specific specifications that if you push hard enough, you can find what those specifications are. If you want to get very much into the process of buying your materials. And of course, regrind is part of the extrusion process, and then sheet sag is part of the original resin formulation itself. From mechanical specifications, again, all these are available, typically published for each grade of polypropylene or polyethylene or whatever type of resin we're using, Eling elongation, garden impact, IZ, IZOD impact, tensile strength, modulus of elasticity, tensile modulus, flexual modulus, all these individual specifications do have ASTM guidelines on how these tests are conducted on the physical characteristics of your polymer materials. So it's all been published before. It's nothing that's new engineering at this point in time. Uh, buying plastics uh, from a professional standpoint is, or big industry standpoint, is becoming more and more a unified type of process. And this one, this looked at Procter & Gamble's new supply management strategies because they're a multinational company, had a very good article on how they're managing their plastics from market to market around the world as they make containers that hold their shampoo or their toothpaste or other uh, consumers, consumable type of products that they're making for the, for the uh, consumer market. In terms of our clinical armamentarium of materials, again, this goes back to referring to generics and brand names. As I said, we intermix sometimes without much definition. Polypropylene, copolymer, low density polyethylene are all uh, generic terms. But as I said, if you look at your copolyesters, PET-G, uh, Durplex, Vivex, Spectar are all brand names describing what's basically the same material. Serlin is available from DuPont. It's an ethylene 
uh, copolymer. Proflex is a vinyl acetate. Kydex is an acrylic and, a and a PVC alloy. I said ABS earlier. I made a mistake. Um, it was acrylic and PVC alloy. Those are proprietary. So if you're involved with the procurement of your sheet materials, sometimes you have to be very specific. Go beyond just the generics. Find out what the brand names can be. Because ultra high molecular weight polyethylene bought as subortholine might be more expensive than just buying a generic um, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. Same thing with PEG. Uh, Duraplex is our, an industry trade name for our field. Vivac is from the plastic industry. Vivac could be probably bought a little bit cheaper. You have to basically investigate all that. So to end this segment on materials management, we're going to look at the, look at the just to review a few key words, understanding machine direction. That's probably the strongest point I can make in this. Um, that gives you uh, an understanding of your sheet orientation, how much shrinkage could occur, visual ex examination of your sheet, looking at your chicken tracks and herringbone lines, and of course, understanding that lowest energy state. It can be an effect from our uh, extrusion process, it can be how we actually manipulate the plastic when we do our thermal forming process. And that brings us to the end of this segment. In segment four, we're going to take a look at the hating phase of our vacuum thermoforming process. In this segment, we're going to cover orthotic versus prosthetic thermoforming, forming temperatures, oven design and performance, temperature process controls, processing window, and a little bit on oven maintenance. Of course, this puts us into another part of the triad, the actual physical element of heating our plastic materials to bring them to the point of being soft enough to have that, that polymer flow, that polymer chain flow that we talked about that helps us mold those materials into the shape of our positive models. Now, there is a difference between, broad difference between orthotic versus prosthetic thermoforming, primarily because in orthotics, we're starting with a flat sheet that typically has been heated on a tray within an oven versus drape forming or bubble forming as we do in prosthetics where the sheet is held within a frame that's suspended in the oven and as the sheet material becomes soft it forms into a uh, bubble or a billow and from there that is placed on top of the truncated cone that is the typical shape of a prosthetic positive model. In prosthetic forming there is somewhat a built-in indicator uh, which is directly related to the length of the bubble itself. Not only the length, but obviously the diameter of the frame itself. Um, once you have a certain bubble volume that has a relationship to the size of your positive model, then you know that material is ready for vacuum forming. Now that the types of residual limbs that can be accommodated with thermoplastic material, of course, is very varied. Uh, very wide, all based on the thickness of the material, the size of the frame, and of course the volume of the billow. Now there are specific oven uh, designs for prosthetics. Typically they're longer, they're taller, so that you have the actual uh, volume or space to allow that billow to form within the oven. Some do have top and bottom heaters. Some have top and bottom controls or monitors in order to monitor the temperature of the plastic as falling into that, into that billow or that bubble. Uh, in terms of vacuum forming mandrels, people have uh, designed their own mandrels, sometimes made out of aluminum, sometimes made out of wood. Some folks preheat the mandrels, some folks uh, leave the mandrels as, as the same temperature as the lab, ambient uh, environmental temperature. So it all depends on those idiosyncrasies that you set up in your own individual lab. Now there are some direct correlatives between industrial thermal forming and prosthetics, primarily because you are using a frame. And so within the literature of the industrial thermal forming, they do have draw ratios which compare height to dimension, which is the ratio of the measured height of the positive model to the greatest dimension across the form part. And you can use some mathematical formulas that basically give you some guidance in terms of what those ratios should be. You have also aerial draw, which is the ratio of the area of the positive model to the sheet that is used to form the socket. And sometimes it's a 7.5 to one type of ratio in terms of aerial draw. So again, you do have some very specific guidelines within industrial thermal forming.
On a standpoint of orthotics, for that encapsulation thermal forming, we are completely wrapping a positive model. We're really trying to manipulate a flat sheet to, into a 3D shape. And this particular picture comes from some very old archives of my own, where, as you can see, we've got four people manipulating one sheet in a very complicated type of thermal forming process. This was a paper I presented way back in 1984 on the, on the fabrication of custom carass ventilators. And that was almost like a big turtle shell that we would make for, uh, for polio patients who needed a nocturnal type of respiratory device in order to, to overcome the effects of sleep apnea. So that was a specialty that we did at the Rehab Engineering Center at Children's Hospital at Stanford. And we had a, a, obviously a very specific vacuum foaming uh, procedure for that, but nonetheless, you are manipulating a flat sheet into a uh, three-dimensional shape. Uh, probably what started my own road on thermal forming was this particular project where I worked as a research orthodist, the AFSO, the Augmented Feedback Scoliosis Orthosis. And when I took this project over from Larry Mortensen, who was the past director at uh, the Children's Hospital in, OMP, in orthotics, I turned this into a modular type of orthosis. As you can see in this picture, there's various uh, electronic components that are added to a, a CTLSO. It was a, uh, probably one of the first scoliosis orthosis that had a built-in monitor. So when we fit this electronic package, the, the electronic package re would remind the student to do an exercise within the orthosis and then also count how many exercises they had done during a certain wearing interval. So it was a very interesting project to be involved in, but because it went to, I turned it into a modular type of construction, I had to hand make all the individual tools in order to hold the modular concept or the modular electronics. So um, it was a very complicated uh, project. And the physician I worked for who was chief of orthopedics at Stanford, Dr. Eugene Bleck, he mandated for all his students, or I should say all his patients, that we absolutely would not use any leather and metal. That was his philosophy. So uh, in the early 80s when plastic, thermoplastic technology was somewhat still um, a new technology, it was mandated at that center that everything was done in thermoplastic. So that's really what established my foundation of using thermoplastic materials uh, for custom orthotics. In terms of that encapsulation thermoforming, as I mentioned earlier, we're really manipulating a thick plastic. We pick it up, but it flows, just as we talked about within the definition of plastics, it has to flow into shape. So when we heat these materials, that we, we want to make sure that they're flexible enough to form into the, comp into the shape that we want, and also to form those component cavities if, to, if we're using some type of ancillary device along with that orthosis. But on the other hand, we can't heat it up too much that we go beyond the point where the sheets are no longer able to be manipulated by hand. We still have to handle that sheet as a semi-solid to give us that hand manipulation ability. So it's a fine balance between having flexibility and also having that hand, uh, enough uh, structural rigidity to be able to afford us that hand manipulation. Now the temperature process controls it's, it's not unlike making a hard or soft boiled egg. You, know, you boil it for a certain amount of minutes, it's a soft boiled egg. You go beyond that, it turns into a hard boiled egg. And for the most part, other than having good process controls, it can be pretty tricky making a soft or a hard boiled egg. Same thing with our plastics. All the thermal plastics that we utilize do have a prescribed temperature range. Uh, Semi-crystalline or amorphous materials all have a range. In regards to the semi-crystal materials, which is the bottom graph, very, it's, a, it's a smaller range from the standpoint of a uh, amorphous type of material, it's a longer range. Um, but they all start at solid at room temperature, and as we heat the materials, they become uh, more fluid to the point that they will actually flow like a liquid, because we can't lose the point of reference that these materials are not only used for vacuum thermal forming, but they're also used for injection molding. And within that process, under pressure, they're pushing molten plastic through the gates and into the mold to completely fill the cavity of the mold. So plastic at that point truly is a liquid. But it's all the same materials, and they all have a range of from a liquid standpoint down to a solid standpoint. Now, how do we measure our plastic sheet materials? I always feel in our labs that the higher the temperature of the plastic gives us an increased ability to conform to complex shapes. 
because we want to be able to make sure that we've completely formed the plastic into the shape that we desire before it reaches room temperature or before it reaches its set temperature, which as we know for polypropylene is 190 degrees. So that drop from maybe 340 degrees to 190 degrees is our working window. That's our processing area. But we want to form it more on the top end of our plastic than the bottom end because at the top end it will flow into those very small spaces or crevices that we need to capture the shape. Whether we're using uh, solid nickel AFO or incorporating some type of uh, post molding dummy or I should say uh, product molding dummy. Um, we do want to capture the intimate detail of those molding dummies because the performance of the component that we then add to the orthosis is sometimes dependent on how well that integration is between the host orthosis or the host piece of plastic and then the component itself. Also from a durability standpoint. We don't want those, compo those components to rock within that little cavity which will then uh, probably interrupt the ability for the fastener to stay integral and hold it to the orthosis itself. Remember our process from the past when thermoforming was first established they were primarily making solid ankle AFOs. Making a solid AF ankle AFO is much easier than some of the more sophisticated products that we are now where we're using articulation with add-on componentry. Uh, in this paper that was published by uh, Dr. Lehman at University of Washington they're demonstrating by using three different trim lines, trim one, trim two, trim three changes the flexibility of the orthosis changes how that patient's able to ambulate within that orthosis basing on uh, uh, having more or less rigi rigidity. And that was published in 1983, all based on trim lines. Processing temperature we talked about uh, earlier. For polyethylene in a Fahrenheit range, 295 to 360. Polypropylene, 340 to 365. And those references will change somewhat, as, even as you look within the literature. Because I find that most of the literature pr produces guidelines for endpoint processors where they're recommending a, a, a temperature that's somewhat conservative. Because since polypropylene doesn't have a very good sag strength and has a, can have a very rap rapid drop in sag strength uh, when it reaches a certain temperature, they have to be conservative because of the way they hold their p materials in a frame a, and that frame is suspended between um, upper and lower heaters. Well, if you get plastic that droops all the way down and hits the bottom heaters, that can create a fire and that would be pretty much a bad here day within a plastic processing plant, a big industrial plant. So their temperatures are somewhat conservative. From my own feeling, I usually heat my plastic from about 350 to 380, maybe 390 for polypropylene. That gives me a very hot plastic to deal with. Typically I can still manipulate it, but it flows extremely well into those intimate shapes that I'm looking to capture. Aluminum tooling, talked about it e earlier, how that aluminum tooling is basically cooled in order to maintain it just below the set temperature. Right? We don't do that in our field, but we have to be cognizant of the fact that when we lay our plastic on a room temperature positive model, which is pretty universal in all OMP labs, very, very few labs actually heat their tooling, that as soon as that plastic contacts the positive model, that inner surface of plastic is immediately starting to solidify. Unless you have very quick vacuum system sealing your plastic and vacuum forming, that inner, inner plastic, if it, if it becomes too thick or too rigid, then I, I, you, you have what I call a reverse eggshell effect. That inner layer becomes too stiff to flow into the intimacies that you want to capture the shape of that positive model. So your whole process has to be pretty quick. Uh, at one point in time, I sent Dr. Jim Throne a videotape of a vacuum forming process of, of myself vacuum forming a solid ankle AFO. And I asked him to comment on our process. And we had a, we had a really good conversation, uh, but he felt that our entire process, from the time of opening the door, grabbing the sheet, putting it on the model, vacuum forming it, sealing it, and bringing out the, evacuating the air from underneath the plastic should be done in less than 25 seconds. So you have to be pretty quick. It's nothing that you want to have a relaxed type of, of uh, hand manipulation process. It has to be somewhat choreographed if you're more than one person, and you have to do it very quickly so that way there you get that, that, that very good flow of the material again on top of your positive model. In terms of ovens, 
Uh, there's multiple heating mechanisms, obviously, and multiple size configurations, depending on the nature of your practice, with whether your emphasis is to more O and P or, or have a 50-50 uh, bias. Um, the size of your lamp, obviously how big an oven you can accommodate within your, in your physical facilities, and then of, also what kind of heating mechanism. At this point in time, we can divide heating mechanisms into three main groups, convection, conduction, and radiation. Convection is the slowest because you're heating air, which is then heating your plastic sheet. Conduction is quicker because that's direct contact. That's when it's almost like a waffle line you saw in that previous picture. It closes down, directly contacts the top and bottom of the oven and is pretty quick. We don't see those too much in the United States. I used to see those quite often in Europe because they're, uh, they're a, a relatively inexpensive oven to produce because they have a smaller box, obviously less materials to make the device. But I find it was always very difficult because you're, in, you're imprinting on both services and unless you had extremely clean platens, sometimes you'd open it up and almost like opening up a waffle island a little too early before the waffle was cooked and it, the plastic would stick to the top and the bottom. And then radiation, which is light energy, which is our fastest technique, that's what I find most labs are going to at this point in time. On the industrial side, that's all you see. Um, to explain the difference in, those, in some of those ovens, a gravity convection oven just means you've got a heating element, which is typically a resistance coil that's changing electrical energy into heat energy or a gas burner, catalytic burner, or open flame somewhere in your oven like a pizza oven. And that, within the oven itself, just the normal currents of hot air rising will basically make that oven environment uniform or not. Some convection ovens have fans which will blow air across the plastic. These are a little bit quicker, uh, primarily because there's a phenomenon that occurs that there's almost a boundary layer of air that adheres to the surface of the plastic unless you blow that away in a convection oven that can basically slow down the heating process. So that's why convection ovens are a little bit quicker. They break up that, that layer of boundary air that's on the plastic. Um, this is basically a Grieve oven, which is very a uh, brand name, which is very common in our industry of being a forced circulation, forced air circulation oven. Uh, this is the direct contact ovens like I would see in Europe. As you can see, it's a very thin oven, lay your plastic in, and it basically the top and bottom do contact the sheet. So it's almost like a sophisticated waffle iron in some respect. Infrared ovens are the fastest current method. We do have several manufacturers such as, such as Weitzel and PDQ that produce specifically for our field and I find these universal internationally at this point in time. We do have to be aware though that within these quartz tube infrared oven that it's, it's really a combination oven. Um, you're do, you are getting the majority of your heating from the infrared light energy exciting the molecules and heating the plastic. But you also should be aware that that light energy only penetrates the top two or three microns of plastic uh, in, from a heating standpoint. The rest of that sheet or body of that plastic is being heated through convection energy being generated from that top layer of plastic. So, uh, so, there, so there are some temperature differentials that can occur in plastics, especially when you're vacuum forming with colored plastic, that the top surface can be vacuum, be very hot the bottom surface can be a little bit cooler. So sometimes you can, um, sometimes you have to be very aware of that differential in temperature. And I've got a, a little physical sample here that I'll show you how you can tell if you've got proper control of your plastic by a simple visual inspection that all of you can do every time you trim out uh, any of your thermoplastic products. In terms of the industrial sign, as I had alluded to a few minutes ago, you find that all industrial thermoforming machines, vacuum thermoforming machines, do use some type of infrared generator. And it, in our field, we see quartz tubes. In that field, they're moving a little bit more towards halogen tubes because they heat up to a higher temperature and they heat up quicker. Um, so they're, move, they're, they're a little bit more efficient. In, in some industries that have access to inexpensive natural gas, you'll find that they'll use gas catalytic ovens as well. Uh, but I find those, those are mostly in big, large in industrial settings. Most places do use the quartz too. Um, this is where I talked about being very cognizant of the, the surface temperature or the top surface temperature of your plastic 
and bottom temperature. You can actually have a differential. Cool on the bottom, of course, a differential, a little bit higher temperature in the core, and on the top, be very hot. In terms of oven maintenance, you do want to schedule that on a routine basis. If you are using a quartz tube, you have to clean your tubes. Um, a couple um, years ago, there was an article in the Thermoforming Quarterly, and they published an article of how to maintain your infrared oven. So this is nothing I'm making up. And they recommended that every four months, depending on your exhaust system and your cleanliness of your work area, that you do clean your tubes, use denatured alcohol, a lint-free cloth, use lint-free gloves, do not touch the, the bulbs with your bare hands, uh, make sure your oven is off and cool. That's one of those obvious things, but in some people you might want to remind that, that the oven should be off and cool. And basically in between that four month period, it never hurts to take your compressed air gun and just blow the dust off the tubes that's inside your oven. Uh, make sure it's a clean environment because as you have dust or, di or dirt collect on these glass tubes, it reduces the capacity of that light energy past being generated within the tubes, being basically passing through the bulb down to your plastic. So in essence, if you have dirty quartz tubes within your oven, you have a very sophisticated convection oven, not necessarily an infrared oven, um, because infrared tubes are somewhat ineffective or inefficient, I should say. The amount of electricity passing through the tubes is um, only 50% of the electrical energy passing through the tube is actually converted into infrared energy. The other 50% is created into or is turned into convective heating. So in essence, even your infrared oven does utilize both convective and infrared light energy to heat your plastic sheet. You just want to be able to make sure your oven is the tubes are clean so you have a, as much efficiency coming out of the IRR generators as possible. In terms of looking at the temperature of our plastics, um, there's a textbook that I went through that's called Temperature Control Principles for Process Engineers. There was one of the authors, one of the chapter authors wrote a great uh, little segment and from her, parag to paraphrase one of her statements, I always like to say that anything not measured is not controlled. And so earlier how we talked about using the clarity of polypropylene once it reaches melt temperature, uh, turning into a clear material rather than opaque, being our processing cue in the past, that just doesn't give us enough control, all, primarily because it's too wide of a span. If you're going to have some process discipline in your labs, you do have to measure the temperature of plastic. And I can't say that statement any stronger than what it is. That clarity isn't good enough. It just is not good enough. And once you put a little discipline into your lab, you will always use a tool to measure the plastic temperature rather than just on that transient clarity. Now, at this point in time, I use a non-contact infrared thermometer. These are accurate to 1%. They can give you a readout both in centigrade and Fahrenheit. They're handheld. They're laser targeted so that you can have basically uh, aim it right at a specific pot on your piece of plastic. And they're, at this point, they're inexpensive. You can purchase one of these for about $50. As you point it at your piece of plastic, it basically shoots out a cone that gives you a field of view so that you know the operating parameters, that you're not measuring your oven temperature, you're actually measuring your plastic temperature for a certain size spot. I recommend that you keep a process record, that you have a little coupon for each patient, that if you're making something out of a thermoplastic material, that you have your technician put his initials on it, put the patient's name on it, put the fabrication date, and take five readings off the top of your, of your piece of plastic. That does entail a little bit of, of time, not too much, minute or so. It does keep some record keeping, but you have a process record. So that way there, if you're ever challenged in a court of law of how you produced your product, you have a record and you can say you follow standard thermoforming industry guidelines in your production and that shows that you as a professional have control of your process. If you say I put a piece of plastic in the oven, waited and turned turn clear and turned on the machine and made a sucking noise, that's not going to give you a very strong statement of defense showing how you have made and fabricated or manufactured these products. So I do recommend a process record. 
In terms of that preferred PP molding I talked about, I like it about 360 to 390. It's very, very easy to measure a sheet with one of these infrared devices. In terms of processing temperature reference or range, if you look in some of the published materials, all these materials of different formulations all have a processing range that can be found in a published uh, reference. In terms of availability of these devices, you can buy them at your local Radio Shack, which is, as you know in the United States is just about every, any street corner. Many of your electronic shops uh, in other countries will also carry this, these infrared devices. At one point in time, when I first started using these, and then I introduced these to the field at a paper I gave at the AOPA National Assembly in Washington, D.C. back in October of 1994. These devices were huge, uh, about the size of a good sized set of binoculars, and their cost at that point in time was about $1,800. Now they're about $50, all basically one piece. At one point in time, I had, well, I still have the device, where the infrared basically uh, sensor was a separate component of a digital thermometer and you would plug it into the thermometer, take your reading and that's how we process or basically followed our temperature at that point in time. We also, uh, once the electronics became uh, uh, less expensive, we also looked into the aspect of putting them into ovens and for a while we manufactured a few ovens, that was short lived, but we did make the first uh, infrared oven in OMP that had a temperature monitor basically built into the system with a closed loop system. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit more to that. But within that oven, you could actually measure the temperature of the plastic, which is sheet directly in the oven. Um, I also had one made, and I think they've only built one, by PDQ, that little box on the top of their BT model of oven, which is still the one I have in my lab on the West Coast. That's an infrared monitor that's sitting on the top of that oven. Um, it's still an open loop. Uh, type of oven. Most of them are. Uh, Witzel is the only one that creates a closed loop uh, controlled oven. And what I mean by that is most ovens, uh, whether they're convection or infrared, have a bimetallic thermocouple on the inside of the oven. And this is a little metal rod made out of two different metals that when you heat it up creates electrical current. That electrical current is read by the oven controller and it measures the environment of your oven. It does not measure the temperature of your plastic. That's an open loop controlled oven. Temperature control, uh, for those of you who have an older oven, convection oven, instead of having a digital controller, you might have an analog type of dial to adjust your range. Um, that has a rectifier on the inside of it. There's the bimetallic thermocouple up in the roof of the oven. That, that's pretty much still standard, whether it's a closed loop or an open loop. That's the type of device that measures the oven environment. Uh, bimetallic, as I said, connected directly to an analog rectifier. But the problem with that is you've probably heard some of these off ovens clicking. Uh, it's clicking on and off. Well, that's the analog rectifier basically turning the heaters on, turning them off. And in, on the inside of that oven, you'll have somewhat of a hysteresis or a flow in temperature as it gets hot and cold. Depending on the precision or the adjustment of that rectifier, you might have a big, a big change in the oven processing temperature. I know at one point in time I was having with, uh, trouble with one of our convection ovens trying to run some thermoplastic composite tests and had a week of failures primarily because the rectifier was off by 60 degrees. So with that kind of temperature differential, I just couldn't get the control test we wanted to do with our thermoplastic composites and it all came down to how well that rectifier was working, how it was adjusted. Um, in a closed loop oven, you have an infrared eye that reads the temperature of the plastic that infrared eye then is connected to the controller. It controls the electrical energy going through the quartz tubes so that way there when you put a sheet of plastic in, in a closed loop controlled oven and that infrared eye is measuring the, the surface temperature of the plastic, if you set your upper limit of your oven to your processing temperature of your plastic, you will never overheat that plastic. And this type of technology is what's used in the, in the greater industrial thermal forming era because this technology gives you the most, that gives you the highest degree of precision in terms of your process control. A closed loop infrared oven. Uh, as I said, Witzel, these ovens are made in Germany. This is the only one that I know of in our field at this point in time that is truly an infrared heated oven with closed loop controller. Um, 
Some of the technology that's used in the industrial side that hasn't come to our field at this point in time is infrared thermography. And this is a, basically a video camera that works in the infrared spectrum that can actually take a full, a, a real-time picture of your heated device and give you a thermal bar of what the temperature of your device is. Here's a, uh, is an example. This is a paper production plant. I'll bring my cursor up. You can see these large rolls that are used for processing the paper. The infrared eye is reading the temperature of that paper production. And on the side here, you can see your thermal bar, basically going from 85 to 215 degrees of Fahrenheit. So a process control engineer has a greater ability to monitor the consistency of his process in real time by looking at that temperature bar. Um, I think this would be highly useful in our field. Um, here's what the cameras look like. They look like a little video camera. The picture on the left is actually a, a thermograph on an injection molding tool. We can see the bright yellow being the hottest temperature is where the plastic is flowing through the gate into the cavities of the mold. And of course, as it goes through, the plastic hits the perimeter of that mold. It's turning blue, which of course is a cooler temperature where the plastic is solidifying. In our field, I think that this would be helpful for a, at least a, a, a controlled exercise where you could basically take a picture of the plastic as it's being pulled over a room temperature positive model. And we, for, we could really see, get a visualization as to whether that plastic is all cooling at the same rate. If it's not, then we might want to change our process somewhat. And that might give us a good indication of whether we should heat our, our positive models to above room temperature. It's depending on how it's cooling, how uniform that cooling is. Because if it's not uniform, that means there's stresses that are being formed into that plastic as it's cooling. And obviously, that's something that we don't want in that plastic, which might interrupt with the, with the characteristics of that plastic, might interrupt, obviously, the durability of that product. So I think that's where this infrared thermography might be a tool that we could use in further studying the precision of our process. Um, biometallic thermocouples, uh, again, just connected to a digital thermometer. You can, they're flexible leads. You can put them inside your oven. And I've used this in order to quantify my controller on the oven. So that way, they, when I set the oven at 300 degrees, I know my oven's going to be at 300 degrees. So again, it's a very inexpensive tool, uh, very standard in the electronics industry and process industry in order to have that type of process monitoring. At one point in time, before we turn to the electronics, we actually use chemical temperature indicators. Uh, the the uh, uh, Temple Label Company makes these little sticky, these little uh, self-adhesive chemical indicators. So we tried these for a while. We'd actually put this on a piece of plastic. It would go into the, into the oven. As these little pieces of plastic had a gold dot on them, they would change temperature. That would let you know that you reached a specific process temperature. So these were handy to use before we got to the electronic standpoint. And uh, we've also, they also sell crayons that will change color. Um, the crayons actually became very handy in our lab in marking aluminum when we would try to anneal aluminum before bending. So if you do that type of process and are looking for some type of process indicator that, to let you know that you've heated that aluminum to the proper temperature for annealing, for contouring, then that Temple Label Company has that type of product. So very handy type of uh, tricks to have in your lab. Um, the first type of very crude uh, temperature process control we did in our lab uh, back in Troy, Michigan, uh, was back in the era when we were still using Baker's ovens, kind of a pizza oven. And I came through the lab one day, and I noticed our technicians had opened up the oven door, pulled out a large sheet of plastic, flipped the tray around, and put it back in the oven. They were getting ready to, to vacuum form a TLSO, a spinal orthosis. And so when I saw them do that, I walked up to them and I said, you know, you're cooling down your oven because this is just a, a convection oven. As soon as you open up the door, you lose all your heat. And they said, yeah, we know that, but if we don't turn the sheet around, then the whole sheet doesn't basically come up to molding temperature. One part of it stays opaque and the other it's all clear. So at that point in time, uh, we cut a piece of butcher paper, which we used to put on top of our lab benches. We put it in the oven, let it basically come up to a very hot temperature paper uh, charge at 375 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we pulled it out, and we laid a, a clean strip of butcher paper on top. And you can see from this 
uh, visualization that within that oven, our left front was very cool, the right rear was extremely hot, just looking at the char of the paper. Uh, I always recommend having a fire extinguisher nearby when you do, if you do this type of test, obviously, because paper can burn. Uh, but from this, we determined that we had a cold spot in the oven. And when we looked at the oven, had a service people came in, they said that we basically had a burner that was out. And at that point in time, it really wasn't worth fixing that old type of pizza oven. So we, we, we transferred, and that's when we started using infrared technology. And this is back in the early 90s as well, when that type of technology change started in our field, the movement towards infrared rather than using the, the older or more standard convection ovens. So in this segment, um, we talked about encapsulation thermal forming, as we do basically in orthotics, uh, man manipulating that, that solid sheet into a 3D form. We talked about drape forming, which is using a frame, which we use in bubble forming for prosthetics, and how it has some mathematical correlation to industrial thermal forming. We talked about conduction radiation uh, ovens. We talked about open and closed loop controllers in the oven. We talked about the hysteresis of an analog rectifier controlling the temperature on the inside of your oven. We looked at the modern technology, the coming technology of infra infrared thermography, and that's still very expensive. I have not been able to see a deep discount in, in that electronic componentry as you see in everything else. You know, most electronic uh, devices become very cheap over time. Unfortunately, infrared thermography, because it's not widely used, hasn't become that cheap at this point in time. Uh, I've seen it used by uh, fire departments to, to check to see hot spots in a fire. I've seen it by, used by environmental engineers to see if you have any heat leaks or cool leaks in your house for air conditioning and heating. But uh, those are the two primary areas that I've seen it used at this point in time. Uh, and unfortunately, with such, that's such a mar small market niche. I haven't seen it come down into that couple hundred dollar range where it would be applicable or affordable for our field. There's still uh, in the thousands of dollars for those units, typically about $4,000. They used to be about $40,000. Buy a metallic thermocouple, that small bar you have somewhere in your oven. All of us have one in the ovens, um, except for the wind cell oven, to measure the temperature of your oven environment, the field of view of your, both of your handheld infrared devices, and then, of course, that reverse eggshell making sure we're doing our thermal forming process quick enough so that way there, that inner layer of plastic that's coming in contact with our positive model is not solidifying so fast that it's blocking the flow of the plastic to capture the intimate shape that we want from our positive model. So that basically covers all the aspects of our heating phase of our vacuum thermal forming process.